All right, welcome. Recorded. Welcome to our New York Giants Preservation Society meeting tonight with uh, Dr. Don Jensen. Uh, before we get started with him, just want to go over a few things. Next week, we will have uh, Bill Lamb. Bill's on board tonight. Uh, he is doing a presentation on the giant ownership. Going to do a two parter. One will be. Um, from the origins of the team, and then he'll be on later on in the uh, in the summer to discuss uh, the team up until uh, they left in San Francisco. Um, whoever requested the buttons, all the buttons went out. All I ask is that if you do get one, to notify me that you got it. We had some problems, but I repackaged everything now, and it seems like uh, everybody's getting them, and they're not coming back empty. Um, couple of weeks, the Giants will be in town uh, to play the Mets starting on the 18th. Uh, people said, uh, are we doing anything? Uh, you know, with, with the lockout and everything, it's, it's going to be probably, hey, you go into the game, kind of meet me at whatever. Day. So, um, with that being said, uh, I'm going to turn over the uh, program to uh, Don Jensen. Don is a longtime uh, Sabre member. And he, his presentation tonight, hopefully it'll work well. I'm going to have to try to help Don with this. But it's on Harry M. Stevens. And, of course, we've all sucked down some hot dogs, sodas, brews, whatever it is, all during this time. And Harry had a uh, relationship with both the New York Giants and the San Francisco Giants. So, Don, I'm going to turn it over to you. When you tell me you're ready. Then I okay, Gary. You know, I've got a now. I've got a screen that says has the stuff. If I hit share, maybe that will be able to share it. Try that. that. That'd be great. There <laughs> you go. All right. All right. Good man. Now, how do I? Now I can't see the screen, of course. But that's another thing. Hold on a second. That tra that. There you go. Perfect. There you go. All right. Let's go. How Welcome long aboard, Don. Thanks for joining us tonight. Well, I can talk about hot dogs and mustard all day. So how long do you want me to go? <laughs> to about 7.45? Yeah, that sounds about right. All right. First of all, thank you for having me. I'm one of those uh, delinquent society members. I've been a member member uh, for many years. And then Gary called me a couple months ago and said, Don, you haven't done shit since you've been a member. Why don't you present something? And so, so here I am. I want to thank... My uh, colleague, Barry, are you there? I don't see you. Right here. Hi, Barry. Thanks. Barry's a Twins fan. So we were yes. in Columbia, but if you want to throw something at him, uh, <laughs> please do. Uh, I'm a lucky, as a Giants fan, I'm a real lucky guy. I, uh, uh, I'm a native San Franciscan, and my dad, when I was a very, very small, took me to Seal Stadium, first to see the Seals, and then to see the Giants. I saw Musial and uh, Ernie Banks play at Seal Stadium as a toddler. Uh, but my dad had played baseball at Galileo High School with Dominic DiMaggio and New Joe and could not ever admit that that, that, uh, that Willie Mays was a better ball player. And that was one of our father-son oh. father rivalries for a long time. But my other favorite giant was uh, Johnny Antonelli oh. as an Italian-American. Oh. He was always one of my my favorites. Uh, by the way, I see Barry Margulies there. Barry, thank you for your stuff. It's right here in the room. And you're going to have to pry it out of my cold, stiff hands. But no, I'll send it back to you. OK, so let's talk about one of the great early pioneers of the game, who's once was regarded as a, frankly, an oligarch, with the equivalent of some of the great owners of the turn of the century, 19th century. Harry M. Stevens, who's now become sort of a uh, mythological character. Uh, he's given credit for a lot of things. The invention of hot dogs at ballparks, the invention of the modern scorecard, and a lot of other accomplishments. So we're going to go into Harry's life and times tonight to tell you a little bit more about him. Uh, I should say that when I was the Giants' first season in San Francisco in 1958, uh, Harry Stevens' name was all over the concessions at Seal Stadium. And uh, every spring, 
an old writer named Prescott Sullivan for the San Francisco Examiner would have a hot dog contest. And he, the very first game in Seal Stadium in 58, he tried, he did a sampling in his column of whether the Seals hot dogs were better or worse than Harry Stevens. And Harry's, Harry's of course had taken over the concessions in San Francisco. And he pronounced Harry Stevens, every good a hot dog, every good a hot dog as the Coast League used to have. So Harry got the seal of approval, but not all things were rocky. No, not all things were smooth after that. So let's go through Harry's life. It's extremely interesting, very colorful. He was a friend of many of the uh, uh, baseball titans of his day from Christy Mathewson to Babe Ruth. Uh, and as I said, as really is a pioneer in the baseball model that we see today. Very few people uh, did more than Harry to form what they call now the baseball experience. I hate that phrase, but you hear that. Uh, Joe Buck says it all the time, but it was really Harry who pioneered a lot of the, these the characteristics of a baseball experience. So let's get into it right now. So I wanna look at the life and times of Harry. I wanna talk about what he did do and what he didn't accomplish. And sometimes his, the legends are comparable to George Washington chopping down a cherry tree. They appear to be, to be just made up. Here's Harry at about 1925. And first of all, it's important to understand that Harry came to the United States from England during the Gilded Age, which is to say the first growth of the middle class. I hate to sound like a professor talking about a few things like this, but so be bear with me. So the, 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 the America after the Civil War was the first time that the middle class grew to any size. It was the first time that people had leisure time. And it's not coincidence that art developed, impressionism, music, ragtime, blues, jazz, in theater, vaudeville, variety, musicals, uh, amusement parks. People had for the first time money to spend on Buffalo Bill's Wild West show and uh, Wyman's big amusement park on Staten Island and Barnum Circus, which had elephants walk up Manhattan from lower Manhattan all the way to Madison Square in the 1860s. This was the first time Americans could afford this. But above all, this was a time that the growth of American sports. Uh, boxing was king, uh, horse racing, baseball by the 1880s and 90s. College football, yes, but not pro football. That was much later. And so urbanization, the spread of railroads, which allowed teams to travel, uh, and free time allowed not only professional sports to develop, but also the growth of celebrities. Cap Anson, John L. Sullivan, uh, my own favorite, John Montgomery Ward, Sarah Bernhardt, Willie Langtree, Carte de Visite, those little photo cards you see, all were developed at the same time in the 18, 1880s. Here's Mrs. Langtree. She was famous for being famous, sort of the early version of the Kardashian sisters. But above all, for Harry and people like Harry and some of the giants like John Ward, this was the growth of the sporting life. Pool halls, girls, bars, everything like that. The golden age of sport for me was not the 1920s, it was the 1880s. This is when John L. Sullivan was a national celebrity. And hangers on, bars, especially around the Tenderloin, which if you know Manhattan, uh, is in the 20s in the west side and around Madison Square. Here is a scene of the polo grounds with a, uh, a young lady, if I can say that, and an admirer watching the game. And the polo grounds at the time was on 110th Street and Fifth Avenue. I'm sure all of you have been near there. And what you had growth is that you also had the growth of Playboys. Ned Stokes, who shot the, uh, uh, <laughs> who, who shot the uh, ex-boyfriend of his paramour, uh, John Montgomery Ward, you all know his story. Uh, Steve Brody, who claimed to have jumped off the Brooklyn Bridge in 1884 and got a lifetime of free drinks at bars afterward for his accomplishment, even though no one knew if he ever really did that. But Harry Stevens was very much a product of this time. He had many nicknames, the Rockefeller of Peanuts, you know, this, the, 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 all sorts. He was a famous, famous guy. He started out as a uh, uh, immigrant from England, born in 1885, arrived in New York City, 
worked in iron mills in Ohio as a bookseller selling a, a Civil War books and that kind of thing. However, we all have turning points. This was Harry in 1887. He went to a ball game in Columbus, Ohio, and saw that the, the scorecard was barely legible, barely readable, inaccurate. He went to the owner the next day of the Columbus Ball Club, and he said, you know, I can make a better scorecard. And that is where Harry's career took off. He got the concession. He got the advertising in only a day or two. By the end of 1887, he was selling scorecards at the World Series, which, as you know, this was a very famous World Series, it took place all over the country. And he apparently was sponsored by the St. Louis Browns famous owner, Chris von der Ahe, and he was on his way. Uh, Colonel Stevens, he started to expand his businesses, his scorecard businesses in the Ohio State League, in the American Association. He got to know all the ball players. Here's his home in Ohio. And by the early 1890s, the Giants come in very quickly, be patient. Harry was, had a sports empire that extended really over most of the Eastern United States. Here is the 1887 uh, World Series scorecard before Harry. Here is the modernized by 1890 80s standards scorecard that Harry printed in Columbus after he got the concessions there. Okay, so he expanded his empire, mostly in the Midwest, then to the Northeast, Boston, Washington, uh, and so forth. He turns up everywhere. He turns up uh, uh, in Columbus, Ohio. He turns up in Milwaukee. He uh, turns up at the uh, negotiations for the Brotherhood League uh, uh, merger with the National League in 1891, sitting in a bar in Manhattan with King Kelly. And evidently he was covering the negotiations for the Columbus Dispatch newspaper. Those of you who see the picture here, which is where the negotiations took place, well, it will look familiar. This is today, Italy, the restaurant on Madison Square. And you'll see, can you see the pointer? This clock, if you go there tomorrow, you'll see Italy right here. You'll see the clock right here. This is the whole Italy restaurant establishment. And across the street here, was where uh, Edith Wharton was born, who wrote Age of Innocence. So Harry was a baseball mogul long before people gave him credit. As he expanded eastward, he was a partner with Ed Barrow in Pittsburgh. Barrow, of course, becomes not only the discoverer of Honus Wagner, but later Barrow is, of course, a major league mogul with the Yankees. They did theaters, they presented uh, theater programs, they presented, excuse me, they printed scorecards for the print of the Pittsburgh Alleghenies, which was the team at the time. And then finally in 1894, he comes to New York City. The legend is, and I have no reason to doubt it, that it was John Montgomery Ward who invited him to sell food at the Polo Grounds now in Upper Manhattan. He was lucky. Dasher Troy, the old New York Metropolitan shortstop, ran a bar in the left in the right field toward the outfield. And uh, People would stagger around drunk, like, as Dasher did, all through the, ball, the game. And this was the perennial problem, is the entertainment, is that the stadium club is the bar there for its own sake, or is it there to enhance the baseball experience? Dasher took it too far, got in a fist fight with some of the Giants owners in 1894, was fired, and they gave the contract to Harry. Harry becomes immediately a success. If you know Giants history, and my good friend Bill Lamb will probably talk about it next time, uh, the Giants were in one of their periods of greatness. They had closed Troy's bar. Steven set up a soft drink concession, a ginger ale, sarsa asparilla, uh, hard-boiled eggs, pies, stuff like that. And the Giants could therefore clean up their image. But after the end of the first year, when they played in the Temple Cup in Baltimore, he was one of the most popular guys in New York City. He published the, the scorecard right before the game and hung around. He was a sporting man with Nick Engel, DeWolf Hopper, who recited Casey at the bat, Digby Bell. There was an entire troupe of actors around Madison Square who were passionate Giants fans and traveled with the team wherever they went. Okay. His expansion 
There was even a Broadway play where Harry was a character. The expansion of the business went throughout the rest of the 90s. Even though the Giants had a bad uh, run there. Uh, and by the turn of the century in 1900, Stevens was in many ways a baseball mogul, every bit the equivalent in stature and fame of many of the team, team owners. Now, I want to pause here and go back into the concessions, which Harry pushed to give you a sense of what, how it happened, how it did not happen, and many of the questions we still have. Food was sold at ballparks very, very early in the game, the 1860s and 1870s. It's, it's, it's uh, not easy to find evidence, but there, there is examples. You can see in newspapers, Brooklyn had a three course meal, cherry pie, cheese, chewing gum, my favorite tripe, chocolate, onions, and so forth. All were sold at ballparks, whether it was Brooklyn or Boston and so forth. But what, there were controversies. Can you sell liquor on Sunday? Can you play baseball on Sunday? And as the most of you know, the National League was the clean league and tried to minimize alcohol consumption. It was the American Association run by Harry's old friend, Chris Vanderhaar from St. Louis, called the, who called the Beer and Whiskey League, which sold a lot of the liquor, the alcohol, and some of the more uh, dubious uh, operations. Remember, Chris Vanderhaar ran a saloon in his outfield. He ran the team, the Browns, really to stock his saloon. Harry and the Giants owners ran the Giants with Harry being an enhancement to the ball game. Okay, so what Harry? What did Harry do? This was an entirely new revenue stream for the Giants fan, Giants owners, for other teams who went under contract with people like, like Harry. Uh, uh, this was also, by the way, that the time of the development of fast food, uh, Aunt Jemima's pancakes, juicy fruit gum, Pabst Blue Ribbon beer, and shredded wheat. Uh, all debuted at the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago. Uh, Cracker Jack, our friend who just had the Cracker Jack on the screen, is mistakenly said to have originated for that World's Fair. It actually did, pre premiered a few, uh, a few years later. Now, this is from the Police Gazette in 1885. Interesting in many ways. You've got a ladies' day here. You've got urchins trying to sneak into the game. But most of all, you have this guy selling food and Sahir selling beer to fans. And it's not clear here whether he is going into the stands or whether he's bringing it somewhere else or is he selling it. He's clearly not selling it at a vending stand. But this is the earliest picture I could find of concessions being sold at ballparks. Uh, so what Harry did then is he brought the game to the fans. He brought the hot dogs to the fans later. He brought scorecards to the fans. And what Harry did was tailor the offerings, especially the scorecards, to the city. He would print up scorecards in German to sell in Milwaukee. Uh, Harry pioneered the drinking straw in, in uh, soft drinks. Marvin Chester Stone, a man who all, most of you uh, have read about, I'm sure, patented the drinking straw in 1888. That was, before that time, uh, soft drinks were drunk out of reeds that were plants, so which, which uh, affected the taste of the soft drink. Harry was the guy who took Martin Chester Stone's drinking straw and introduced it to ballparks so you could drink your beer or drink whatever and see the action on the field. That was Harry's, uh, uh, Harry's uh, innovation. Here's a little bit more about scorecards. Again, Harry was the one, he didn't invent the scorecard, but he made it clear, he modernized it. He made every game scorecard applicable to that day's game. So it was printed in, uh, in the morning, okay? I'm trying to change this here. Okay, here is, you can see that. Here's a scorecard for the 19, 1892 before Harry for the Giants. Here it is after. You see he's jazzed it up. Here is our hero, John Montgomery Ward, in the center. This is for the first season in New York in 1894 when New York played the Orioles, of course, in the Temple, Temple Cup. Okay. Now, on peanuts, 
peanuts were sold very early at ball games. The problem was that you had to clean up the shells and it was expensive. Many owners didn't want to do that. Harry modernized the sale of peanuts. He would bring those to the stands, the little bags. And it was Harry who invented the phrase working for peanuts because Cavagnaro's peanuts in Manhattan could not pay Harry what they owed him. So they gave, they paid him in peanuts so that he said, well, I don't get any money out of this. I'm working for peanuts. That's Harry's expression. One down one more. And finally, hot dogs, of course, our favorite. Here's Bogey eating his favorite food. And the legend is that in the chilly day in April, April 1901, Harry's son said, Dad, let's sell those German sausages at nearby Yorkville. You know where that is. Uh, and that will allow the fans not to be so cold and they will be happy by eating uh, hot food. Uh, the cartoonist Tad Dorgan used the phrase, invented the phrase hot dog. And forever after, including today, Harry is often seen as the, as the originator of hot dogs at ballparks. Unfortunately, here's Tad. Tad was a guy who was a invented all these phrases, hard-boiled, drugstore cowboy. He was a popular cartoonist who hung around the polo grounds and the Giants games and was known all over the country. Here's one of Tad's hot dog cartoons based on what Harry sold at the polo grounds. The reality, of course, is quite different. Uh, it's sort of comparable to the, it's the concessionaires parallel to the Abner Doubleday myth. Uh, it did not happen anywhere near like the legend says. In fact, uh, hot dogs were apparently sold in the Midwest, perhaps by Von Der Rade and the Browns, in the 1880s, uh, especially in those cities where there were heavy German immigration. And so, not surprisingly, the St. Louis teams, the Detroit and teams in the Midwest, were really the first clubs to sell hot dogs, even though Harry was given credit for inventing it. He did not. But like so much else that happens in New York, New York's given credit for it, even if it didn't happen that way. The other alternative is that hot dogs may have and simultaneously entered into the, the sporting life, the ballparks, the football stadiums, the boxing arenas, by the introduced by the large number of Jewish immigrants to New York City at the turn of the century. Charles Feltman, a German immigrant, sold sausages at Coney Island very early. And there are other stories and evidence that that was sold in other places uh, around the country. H.L. Mencken claimed he had devoured, quote, rubber indigestible pseudo sausages in Baltimore in 1886. They were then far from newfangled. But Harry got the credit. And it was Harry's work, especially at the Polo Grounds, that made uh, him the guy who people claimed had introduced hot dogs uh, at ballparks, soon to be followed by Goulden's mustard, which was then produced in New Jersey. And if you go to Safeway, you'll see Goulden's spicy brown still on sale in aisle 12. It's the very same hot uh, mustard with only the formula slightly uh, changed. I would say later, Goulden's daughter married Harry's, married Harry's grandson. And so the, the headline in the newspaper was, hot dog marries the mustard. There you go. Uh, but I want to pause there before we return to the narrative. Any questions about hot dogs concessions from the group? Yeah, Don, I got a question. Yeah, any please. Yes, I, I, it's a very interesting topic, and we know very little about what actually happened. Very easy question, Don. Is ketchup allowed on the dog? Got to cut. Not gotta to me. Not to me. I only drink good <laughs> spicy. I bought some last weekend to go right here. I was in the giant's mood. Okay. So I want to, by the 18, end of the 1890s. Don, Harry, Don yeah. go, go, go um, to the top to expand your uh, screen. Okay. That's it. There you go. Got it. Okay. And so Harry would have these big sacks of, of uh, mustard, like a sack, garbage sack. And they would do before the game, he and the boys would boil the hot dogs, squeeze the mustard, 
put them in these nice little containers that Harry invented, and you could they were hot water, and you could take them around to the stands at the polo grounds, later Yankee Stadium and elsewhere, to have it relatively, relatively hot. I see a, fan, a hand up here from Mr. iPhone. No? Well, that, that could be me. Back to you, sir, yes. Well, uh, I, I understand there were sausages, you know, in, in places like Milwaukee or Cincinnati, yeah. but did Harry M. Stevens event the bun? that the hot dog would go into. If you, uh, what's your name? My name's Mars Breslow. Mars, hi. Uh, hi. He's often given credit for it. Behind me here, I have one of the great giants libraries in the Western world. And several of the old sports writers give him credit for inventing the bud. Yes, I don't believe it. I've seen no evidence of it, but they claim that he did. Laughs. Okay. All right, thank you. <laughs> all right, all right. So by the end of by the 1890s, Harry was a major sports figure. Hotels, uh, 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 hotels. He catered the Yale Princeton football game, which was then played in the Polo Grounds, a hotel on Staten Island, and so forth. But uh, then a little scandal came into his career. This is Madison Square Garden. This is the northeast corner of Madison Square Park which is today the Metropolitan Life Building. This was the showplace of middle-class entertainment in New York City. Uh, this is the famous statue of the new Diana, which was the top of the Madison Square Garden Tower. It was, joined, it was designed by Stanford White. Stanford White, a member of the upper class, if, the, if a sporting man wanted to make Madison Square Garden, a place that would get high-class entertainment. Here, Sarah Bernhardt right here, other famous actresses, but no one much came to the performances. So what did White do? He, he I won't say cheapened the entertainment. He got entertainment that was of broader interest. Circuses, bicycle racing, which was a big sport then. Buffalo Bill, Wild West show would go into Harry Stephen, into the garden and Harry Stevens would cater all of this stuff. If you've ever been to a Broadway show, and I'm sure most of you have, Frank Strauss was the originator of the Playbill magazine. Gary, you've seen that when you go to Broadway shows with the yellow, does it still have a yellow? Anyway, that was too high class for Madison Square Garden. So they fired Frank Strauss and hired Harry, who was the scorecard king, to give a program that was a broader appeal. Okay. Now, he and Stanford White were the central figures in running the garden for a long, long time. Harry, meanwhile, as you see here, did uh, French opera ball, Metropolitan Opera, all for scorecards, all for, for, uh, for concessions. And his, 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 his career grew and grew. When John McGraw was being enticed by Andrew Friedman to join the Giants as manager, he, Friedman offered McGraw the concessions to the polo grounds. However, Harry was a friend of McGraw and McGraw only took the offer on the condition that uh, uh, Harry would run the concessions, even though he was already doing racetracks, Jock Whitney, America's Cup and all that kind of thing. He was also, he being Harry, also worked for Richard Canfield, the so-called king of gamblers who had a gambling establishment on 44th and 5th Avenue. You can see that door today. Also at Saratoga. And uh, Harry catered the sumptuous dining room at the Saratoga Clubhouse, the Monte Carlo of America, frog legs, champagne, all those things that he would serve in the morning after uh, uh, the gambling throughout the night at Canfield's Casino took place. It was also, of course, a scene of other kinds of activity, as I note here. Here is the dining room that Harry came. <laughs> Diamond Jim Brady and Lillian Russell also were, were habitues. In 1904, Harry adds the Highlanders, Hilltop Park, Barry, a site of Columbia Medical School today. So Harry now starts again to add new baseball uh, franchises to his portfolio. 
okay? And I, you can, he eventually start, goes to Brooklyn and elsewhere as well. Uh, Harry is, little known Harry is also involved in the famous Stanford White murder by the jealous husband of Evelyn Nesbitt. Harry, Harry was at the Volpolo grounds on June, June 25th, 1906, went back to Madison Square Garden where he met Stanford White at the Madison Square rooftop towers. Uh, Stanford White asked Harry to fix him up in the cute little chorus girl on the stage. Uh, he said, yes, he went up to his office and the next thing he heard was the gunshot when Evelyn Nesbitt's jealous husband Here's the garden rooftop. Here's Stanford White before his death. White was, White was sitting uh, right here. The garden rooftop is up here. So Harry really apparently was the last guy to talk to, to Stanford White before his murder. Uh, here's Miss Nesbitt. Here is the cute little chorus girl, if I can use that term. Uh, and it was the trial of the century, a century before O.J. Simpson, really. It went on and on for years. Harry was embarrassed at what happened. Here's Evelyn at the witness stand. Here's the jealous husband being held away by the cops. And the trial went on in years and years. Harry, meanwhile, spent much of his New York time at the polo grounds. Here's the old one. It burned down in April, 1911. Some people blamed Harry. They said his peanut shells caught fire. And that may or may not be true. I don't think so, but Harry was seen white <laughs> as the guy to blame for that. But they rebuilt it quickly. Here's the new Brush Stadium, also called the Polo Grounds in 1912. Harry, of course, was involved in uh, the concessions there, there as well. Uh, Central always was his uh, love for the Giants, the New York Giants. He idolized Matthewson. He idolized Bresnahan. Uh, Iron Man McGinnity once jumped the bar at the polo grounds in, in the middle of a double header, already drunk. And Harry's son told I, the Iron Man, dad doesn't let us serve ball players on day games. And Iron Man just jumped the bar anyway and downed another pint of scotch and went out and won the second game. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Marco Conan lists Harry as one of the Giants board, uh, board of Directors members. I've not been able to, to, to just to, to find that. But clearly, as you see here in the sporting life, Harry was often rumored to be interested in buying a club, even as he expanded to Brooklyn, to the Yankees, and by then had become a good friend of, of Babe Ruth. Horse racing uh, and so forth. Uh, and now we get to the final, the twilight of Harry's career. Uh, he was involved in ways that are not completely clear what these scandals, Charles Stoneham and Arnold Rothstein in the business shady dealings about with Wall Street and Major League Baseball in the 19, 19, 20, and 21. But Harry was never really uh, indicted, but as they say in the press, linked. But he was still very active. He was the caterer at the famous Dempsey Carpentier box heavyweight boxing championship in Jersey City, the first million dollar gate. Here's Tad Dorgan's prediction for the fight. Here is the actual KO. But if you look closely, you can see the crowd and all, I hope all, eating Harry's hot dogs. But this was heavily attended by the underworld and it was also the first major sporting event in the United States where women attended in any large numbers. Harry later claimed. Uh, it was the largest single sale of concessions he had ever done in his career. And the Dodgers, I believe, were playing the same day in Brooklyn, and he also catered uh, there. But the garden was in decline. By the mid-20s, Madison Square Garden had gone out of business and moved elsewhere. Harry remained active, although aging in his uh, sports and concessions empire, Harry, uh, I've I have correspondence of Harry writing Newt Rockne in the 1920s to talk about what would be on the Army Notre Dame football program. So he still did football, football as well. But time was running out for Harry. He hired all these old giants, uh, uh, especially uh, 
Jim Muttry, who worked at the Polo Grounds, Phony Martin, one of the early pioneering New York ball players in the 1860s, was a bartender at the Polo Grounds. Harry wanted to keep all these old guys around. And of course, Harry was a massive collector of baseball memorabilia. memorabilia. I list some of it here. And uh, gradually, however, he faded from the scene. He died in 1934 after moving from the Savoy to the Waldorf to Belmont and Murray Hill and gave the business over to his sons. Now, I'll pause there before I wrap up in the next five or 10 minutes, if that's all right. Any questions right here? I hope this is new information for you. It took me a long time to do the research on this. So, uh, question. What's that? A question. Yes, is that Barry? Yes, it is. It better not be about the twins because I'm not going to answer. No, and it's not about how the Giants should have come to Minnesota before San Francisco, but that's, no, a, no. that's another story. Um, what happened to his wealth? You said it passed on to well, his son. Talk, okay, we're going to get to that, Barry. Right. So in 1934, Perfect. when he died, he died right after John McGraw. So you, there was a very visible passing of the scene from the great 1920s sports heroes, Dempsey and Red Grange and Babe Ruth to a different kind of sporting life in a different kind of economy. And his sons ran, uh, uh, ran the, the, the business. And he did very well for, they did very well for 20 or 30 years. He loaned money to O'Malley to run the Dodgers. Mm -hmm. Harry, Stevens family did. Uh, uh, Stevens uh, loaned money to, is it Houston who owned the Yankees to buy out now, I, get, I, get, I hate the Yankees so much, I get the owners confused. He helped the Yankees buy out Houston because Houston offered or wanted to establish his sons as the concessionaires in Brooklyn. Harry didn't like that, so he had loaned the money to the other Yankee owner to buy the guy out. Uh, uh, but gradually, the market forces were changing. There were other companies who did this in other cities. I'm sure Minnesota had its own local company. Uh, Harry was re remained the largest for most of the mid part of the century, but there were other competitors. But gradually, the company slipped. Uh, they lost the uh, contract with the New York Yankees in eight, 1964. I see Barry is here. You know, the, the other uh, uh, it had a co garden contract, which ended. And gradually, the era changed how number one a lot of the companies for a lot of the companies selling sports concessions was only one part of the business they were they were aramark they sold in schools and hospitals harry's company only did sports concessions number one so that was no longer a viable business model number two uh over the years harry standardized his offering. So a hot dog in Boston looked very much like a hot dog in Minneapolis or San Francisco or New York. And so people started to have more diverse tastes and Harry couldn't keep up with that. Uh, number three, uh, a lot of teams preferred to go with local companies. And if you, I don't know who the twins have right now to sell their, their stuff, but, but uh, people wanted more particular you know, Dodger Dogs or Fenway Franks or whatever you want to call it. And Harry tried to keep up, but really, really couldn't. Uh, uh, in San Francisco, where they came and did pretty well, especially in the 70s, uh, what hurt Harry in San Francisco was this board of supervisors uh, abolished uh, uh, selling beer after the seventh inning. And so that massively cut into the business of all sports entrepreneurs, but especially Harry, whose company was so dependent on sports and not part of uh, the other things, okay? Sad answer. So they went out of business finally in the early 1990s, bought out by Aramark, which is an institutional food provider, cafeterias and high schools and so forth. And so Harry, and there were some family infighting eventually, the company went out of business in the early 90s. Uh, what happened to Harry's collection is not clear. 
I've talked to the Hall of Fame a lot about it. They have some of the stuff that Harry had collected. And as you see here, uh, Leland's, the aux famous auction house, uh, sold some of it. Here, John Thorne gave me this. This is a, a Harry Stevens hot dog box where they would take the peanuts or the hot dogs out and give it to sell it to fans as they walked around the stands. Here is the Canfield Casino today at Saratoga. Still looking beautiful. And in Niles, Ohio, Harry, uh, Harry's home, they still, at least until COVID, still have the Harry Stevens Day every July to honor Harry's contribution to baseball. And you can see I like those ones that are extra cooked there, although I would want Goulden's mustard on them. Uh, and thank you very much for listening. Here is Harry in 1912. That's uh, John Brush, Giants owner, his wife. Here's Harry. I, this may be Mrs. Stevens, but Mrs. Stevens rarely left Ohio. So I don't know who, who this is. So thank you for listening. And I think, Gary, I'm about on time. Gary, you're muting yourself. You're muted. Gary, you're muted. Don, could you um, stop the share screen? Yeah. Just tell me how to do that. Just hit stop share screen. Why don't I just turn this? Can I minimize it? Uh, no, then we don't see everybody. You know what I'm saying? All right. Hold on. Or can I turn it on here? Okay. Here's stop share. All right. Boom. Perfect. There you go. Don, that was amazing. Great, great job. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, one thing before we open up the floor. I should say, Gary, by the way, Sabre wants me to uh, convert all of this, including the post-death story of the company, for which Barry Margolis has helped me a great deal, uh, to a documentary film, Ken Burns style. Oh, that's great. On. But I'm looking for a producer if anybody knows anybody who can who can do that. I'm sorry. Now, that's what, I, for the what I was going to say was your uh, presentation on YouTube for Saber. Yeah. That's a little bit longer. So yeah. I'm also going to send that out along with the copy of this link. To yeah, it's the same audience. slides, but I've uh, thanks to a number of people, including Barry Margolis, I've got more information. That was done a year ago, but please, they can... Uh, I even set it to music in one version, but I took it out. All right. Anyway, thanks again. Let's go to, uh, we'll go to Bill, Harvey, Steve, and then Mars. Thank you very much. That was very enjoyable. And I can literally smell the hot dogs at Candlestick <laughs> Park. Um, <laughs> Bill, Bill, uh, that's 30 years of my life. As much as I love the Giants, I want to forget. I go right to pack. Well, Al, I'm an old purist. So I guess you have to live with me. I, I, I have such a soft spot in my heart for candlestick. And one of those. Oh, wait, Bill, let me, Bill, let me interrupt you again. Barry Kellner, my college roommate here, he's on the screen. But didn't we see the Mary, the Maze Bonds catch Barry when I took you that game? We saw a Maze home run for sure. Okay, um, okay, okay. The, the catch, I'm not sure, but the home run, I, I'll never forget. But at Candlestick, right? Yes. Okay, sorry, Bill, I interrupted. I want <laughs> authenticity here. <laughs> I do recall not only that, that, that smell of the, the hot dogs in the vestibule behind the, uh, the seats, you'll remember at Candlestick, they had those large doors that would clank shut. Uh, and, and, and so the, the you didn't smell it in the stand so much as you did back in the vestibule where they would they would cook the hot dogs. Uh, two things: one, the Golden's mustard. My memory was that was it. They only served the Golden's yeah. mustard. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they were they were part and parcel of that. I liked the Golden's. My mother never bought Golden's mustard at home, so. That was my choice. You know, I, if I wanted to, I ate it there. Uh, the, well, again, yeah, Bill, Bill, I hear they slightly altered the formula. So I was out of it. Oh. I, like, I like Dijon too. So I bought some at Safeway last weekend. Okay. Well, I see yeah, Brown. I That's Dijon is, is far superior. But uh, the, um, the two other things that Harry brought that I, I guess I had never experienced one was 
even though I lived in the Bay Area, my parents either couldn't afford or chose not to buy Ghirardelli chocolate. Yeah, yeah. I always, thanks to Harry, I got to eat that Ghirardelli chocolate at <laughs> Candlestick Park. And I mean to tell you, I can still taste that on my tongue. That was just great. It's great. Wonderful, it's great. It's great. wonderful it's great. food. I it's had great. a I had a good friend who I went to junior high, high school and college, one of my fraternity brothers who later became a United Airlines pilot. He would never let United Airlines know about this story. Uh, another friend of ours, his father took Mike and uh, and me and and Ray to the game, and he he made an offer to Mike. He said, Mike. I'll buy all the hot dogs you'll eat. You have to eat them one at a time. And I have never seen anyone stuff themselves with Harry <laughs> M. Stevens hot dogs like Cos did that day. Uh, you know, he did, we hop freights. We did other things in our life that are not on his resume as he applied for a, a job at United Airlines to be a pilot. And I don't think the hot dog stuffing was either, but we still talk about uh, the hot dogs, how great they were. But I preferred my hot dogs one at a time with a tad of Golden's and a side of that Ghirardelli chocolate. <laughs> well, you know, Bill, I am telling you. Yeah, Harry, Harry and his boys uh, got marketing down pretty well, and different, different, different parts of the, of the country had different eating habits. San, you know, hot dogs would show better in one city than another. Uh, sauerkraut maybe in New York. So they, he actually tailored the offerings. Uh, and some places, you know, I don't think tripe ever sold anywhere. But who knows? <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Harvey, you're up. Thank you. Um, I I have a few memories because I saw my first game at the Polo Grounds. Oh, yeah. And, wow. and I remember on July 10th, 1954, I remember the aroma of my father parked the car on the Bronx side of the river. We walked across the McCombs Dam Bridge and I started smelling these wonderful smells as we were coming down the stairs of the bridge. Um, my father kept score. Somewhere I have the scorecard and it was a Harry M. Stevens scorecard. Yeah. I remember it. I'm going to have a question about that. But what I remember is my I was eight. My brother was five. My father kept score of the game. The Giants lost the Pirates 10-7. But he also kept score of what my brother was eating. And <laughs> Hot dogs, uh, ice cream, God knows what he was eating. I was mesmerized by the game. Um, I, my question is about the scorecards. Where were they printed? I mean, I remember that the, the, the lineup was there. The, it wasn't the exact lineup. My father would scratch out the, the name that was printed there. But where were they printed? Uh, you know, I'm not sure. I think it was New Jersey here, Harvey. You don't see this. Uh several thousand document high pile of crap I have here in the back. <laughs> I'm sure it's in there. Uh, but I believe it was in, in New Jersey and they would bring them over. They would bring them over. I mean, it was a day game. It was an afternoon yeah. game. It was a Saturday. If I hear, if I come back, if I find it, I'll, I'll email you. How's that? Well, thank you. And it was a wonderful presentation. I, 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 I it really was great. You know, when I, I, uh, when Barry and I were freshmen at Columbia, I, I snuck out during freshman week or something and went over to the, where the Pogo Polo Grounds was because as a native San Franciscan who adored the Giants, I, want, I, I, I like the fact that the Giants preserve their history in both cities very strongly. And if you, if you go to uh, AT&T Park today, Barry's tired of my saying that. Uh, <laughs> if, if you've been to AT&T Park today, Bill, you probably have. There's no questions it was McGraw's team because there's pictures all over the place and Matthewson and Ott. And I love the continuity. So for me, growing up uh, near Shield Stadium, uh, for me, it was the same team in, in the Polo Grounds. And it is the same team. So well, that what, I, what I tell people when they ask me why I root for the Giants, I say it's, just, it's really no different when I was a kid. They just play their home games 3,000 miles away from me. <laughs> Harvey, you're absolutely right. Harvey, uh, on, if you go to my Twitter, you'll see I never retweet anything with a Yankee or Dodger picture on it. Never. Well, 
Yeah. <laughs> folks here know I usually refer to the detestable Dodgers, and I have never acknowledged the Yankees at all. Yeah, so. Harvey, except I do. I, re, I, I, re, I retweet Jackie and Koufax. Other than that, nothing. Well, yeah, I, 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 I'll I go for that. And Vince Scully, by the way. I, I like Vince. Vince. Scully, yeah. Well, he was uh, a Giants he, fan anyway. Before. Yeah, he grew up a Giants fan. Absolutely. That was uh, a you know, Mel is, fan. Yeah. And by the way, as you know, uh, in 58, April 58, that first game with Ruben Gomez pitching, the Giants beat the Dodgers eight to nothing. Rush Hodges' first line, I think, when KSFO went on the air was, Welcome to the Polo Girls. And then he, <laughs> and then he corrected himself. It's <laughs> nice that Sinatra was a Giants fan, too, originally. Yeah. There used to be a ballpark, was about the Polo Grounds, I think, that song. That was Sinatra. Right, we got, uh, Steve and then Ed Logan. So was Al oh, Jolson. Ed Logan, I, I know that name. Ed and I have talked. Go ahead. Al Jolson was also a Giant fan. Great yeah. presentation. You know, I'm saying to, I was saying to Gary, there is so much history in baseball. This is just another, another facet. Uh, kind of like Harvey. My first game was one year after I'll his. About one minutes. of the problems with the scorecard was, I remember oh. as a kid, the scorecard was 15 cents, but the pencil, which was a golf pencil, was a dime. That's true. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Harvey, when That's you true. got into the, where the, again, like Harvey was the, my first game was at the Polo Grounds, being a city kid, never saw a park like that with grass. Oh. And then, of course, the smell of the food. Just lastly, um, I know we've done this numerous times, but you guys and ladies, you got to think. Gary has done a job now. This is, I guess, we're in our third year. I don't know how many Zooms. This is like the history of baseball. Let's give Gary another hand. What a tremendous job. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Steve. Um, let's go to Ed Logan. Yeah, hi, uh, Ken. Uh, I don't know if I'm the only one on, on the call that actually worked for Harry M. Stevens, but I've worked at three different locations, maybe a fourth. Um, reason being that my grandfather was Yankees clubhouse manager. My dad was a Giants clubhouse manager. And growing up in the polo grounds, I had free reign to the commissary and uh, for Stevens because I was told that my grandfather helped well, Stevens get into the Yankee Stadium and you saw how he got into the polo grounds, but there was a very close relationship between my grandfather, my dad and the Stevens people. So during my college years, um, you know, because I was the bad boy in 57. In, uh, in the polo grounds. When I got out to San Francisco, I, I worked in Seal Stadium. And the reason that that happened was I got out there in June after graduating high school and I already had a bat boy. So uh, I worked in the stands. You know, I, I did the, carried the, you know, the soda, whatever in the stands. And I also sold hot dogs at Seal Stadium. And then uh, in my, uh, I went to college in, uh, and I came to New York during the summer and I worked at Yonkers and Roosevelt Raceway in the payroll department, um, both all my college summers. And all Ed, Ed I've, got, I've got the 58 team picture right here, about two, two, two feet from me. It's faded. 58 or 57. 57, so you didn't do a 58. I have the team right here. Yeah, there's some confusion on the 57 and 58 cards, uh, but I'm on the 57 team and I'm right right in the middle, sitting on the floor, if you can see it. And that, that team thing has been on uh, Facebook recently again. So anyway, Stevens was, um, you know, he was part and parcel of, of my growing up. Uh, I don't know how many times I went into the concession and Oh, Eddie's kid. What do you want? Hot dogs? They had every. They had chewing tobacco. I tried that once. That was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> they made me dizzy. You know, it smelled good. It tasted, but it oh, knocked me out. So, of course, my dad was over there all the time, and he he got stuff for, for his clubhouse uh, vending stuff. So it, it was very symbiotic. Of course, I never met Harry himself. He was dead. I didn't realize that, but I was dealing with his sons, I guess. And what was he, 325th Avenue, or was that the Giants? Uh, 521 5th. 521 5th, okay. I may have even a payroll slip. I know I have one from the Giants, but I don't know if I have one from Stevens. But uh, all my dad had to do was say, Eddie, Eddie Jr. needs a job for the summer, and boom, I was, I was working for her. And not only that, my dad's youngest sister, um, Ann, 
worked the racetracks in New Jersey for many, many, many years for Stevens. So you can Logan see. Logan did, uh, you know Eddie Brannan? Oh, I know him well. He was a traveling secretary. <laughs> yeah, Ed, Eddie, Eddie started with the Giants in 1905 and, uh, you know, idolized Matthewson like everybody else did. And yeah. uh, so Stoneham brought the whole New York show to San Francisco, which I really, looking back, right. appreciate that. And San Francisco is a mini New York in some ways anyway. Yes. And it's appropriate. You know. I used to call it a clean New York, but that was back then. <laughs> <laughs> really uh, you know new york was not anymore 42nd street it was dirty back then i got to san francisco it was, it was a clean town in 58 yeah, 50, yeah. you know uh, it used not to anymore, be no. and Thanks. to me it was just another another new york uh, i wanted to go to la as everybody knows because the rochers no no connection, no. connection with hollywood uh, we thought that would happen but for all kinds of reasons stone wanted wanted the bay area so yeah, so I, you know, Stevens was like, kind of like a godfather to me. I just, I had total access to them. That's great. Thanks so much, Ed. Mars, go ahead. Well, Don, I want to thank you for joining us. It was a very informative presentation. And Gary, I want to thank you for organizing all this. It was terrific. Uh, I want to mention that in 1933, my pop worked in the polo grounds for Harry M. Stevens as a vendor where he had three jobs during the depression. Uh, not, the question I have is, did Harry M. Stevens lose the franchises in each city one by one, or did it happen all at once? <laughs> no, 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 no. lost Yankee Stadium. No, it was, it, was, it was like a war, you know, yes in some cities, no in others, or he would go lose the franchise and then get it again later. I think that happened in Boston. Uh, so. Uh, it's just and, on the area. And my next question is, I remember that the hot dogs being sold were made by Sabret. They were also sold in New York City subways and all around the city by street vendors. So Sabret, if you have uh, the knowledge of that, uh, were, were they the main, uh, the, the manufacturer of the hot dogs? I don't know. Good question. Good question. I believe it was Sabret, and it had a particular odor, <laughs> but it was one that you loved, you know, and Gilded's Mustard today at the at Oracle Park or whatever it's be, being called now, hopefully Willie Mays Field at Oracle Park someday. But anyway, in order to get Gilded's Mustard now, you have to go up when you leave your seat where they have the condiments, that's where you could still find the big uh, containers of Gildan's mustard, and God forbid you should put French's mustard on a hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, uh, I'm going to look up Sub Red. That's really, really helpful for me. Uh, on peanuts, he ended up buying peanut farms in Virginia so he could always have a supply, and, and they would just tr truck them up. Some of them were huge, like hot dogs, the peanuts. But so he had his own own suppliers. Uh, the quote I have in the on the slide also is a great uh, reminiscence by a, a kid of twelve about selling stuff at the polo grounds and going to the Lower East Side and bringing the pretzels up. You now, great, great time, great time. Thank you, Mars. Thank you, Barry Kellner, you're up. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Don. Great presentation, Gary. Thanks for letting me come on as a guest. Uh, Don, two questions. Uh, you showed the, a box in which uh, uh, Stevens held the, or carried the, uh, the hot dogs. Do you have any sense for how heavy that was? I, I ushered don't. at oh, okay. I ushered at Twins at the Twins ballpark for five seasons, and I was always struck by the hard work of the concession because concessions people. It just struck me that that box looked awfully heavy. Well, good point. Uh, that was given to me by John Thorne, who you know is a Major League Baseball historian. From his yeah. question. But what surprised me about it was that it was made out of wood. And I wonder if there was a metal thing inside. When I think of Harry Stevens, I think of the metal thing they yeah. carry with the hot dogs right there, which I think yeah. was more, yeah. more common. Uh, my other question, and thanks for all the good stories from the old uh, Giants fans. Um, you mentioned a connection with Rothstein that Stevens had. Yeah, was there yeah, any, yeah. any, uh, anything more that you have on that? Uh, no association, I assume, with the 
the Black Sack scandal. No association, but Charles Stoneham, uh, sort of a dubious character, uh, has some <laughs> shady Wall Street dealings. And Harry was involved in some of the Stoneham activity. And all that. that's all I'll say. Uh, Harry by the 20s was really a semi-owner. He had financial interest in a lot of teams, not just the Giants. But Bill Lamb, Gary, is next time. Yes. Bill is one of my good friends, and he he's the expert on the Giants' ownership and the Black Sox, and he would be the one to, to answer that. But Rothstein Barry was involved in that circle of dubious New York business interests. That's yep. that. Got it. But Harry, 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 Harry just to your information, Barry, um, if you like what we're doing and you want to join us in future uh, Zooms, just uh, have Don wow. give me your email and I'll put it on our list, okay? Super, thanks so much, I do. Sean, you're up, Sean. We got Sean, Norm, and then Barry Margulies. Sean, you're up. Sean, you gotta unmute. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. So um, I just wanted to bring up something that is it's not the Giants, but it was the Yankees. When Thurman Munson died, the player they called up was Brad Golden. I thought that was kind of an interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, that's uh, a real stretch to get a Yankee plug in my presentation. Please, <laughs> Don, you know it's not a plug. Golden actually started as a and, giant. And I heard at some point in his career was a giant. I heard someone say that Jolson, Al Jolson, was a uh, yes, giant. Yes, that was me. That was me. And I'm from Washington, D.C. So uh, Al Jolson actually grew up blocks from where National Parks now stand. Is that Sean? Is that Sean? Yes. Hi, Sean. Where are you? I don't I'm, see. I'm on. I'm in my kitchen. <laughs> OK. And there's Bill Lamb at the bottom. But, when, but Don, also, when you explained how uh, um, Stevens would get, make the scorecards local, like the ones in yeah, Milwaukee. Yeah. Yeah. Um, years ago, I, I went to a lot of NFL games and they did a wonderful job then of having a national program and inserting pages that related, you know, to the game you're watching that day. And they uh, everybody's gotten away from that. Programs now are terrible by comparison. So. But um, anyway, uh, it was a great presentation. And I remember first reading about Stevens in a book, More Than a Game, that was a collection of these uh, sports stories by a classic writers like Paul Gallico and uh, Grantland Rice and so on. But uh, the story was called Peanut Fender. And it told it basically the one about um, sending out for the, hot, the sausages on a cold day because all they were selling were ice cream and I guess peanuts. And, um, and that's, you know, it, was, it sounded like it, it was really the legend, you know, it was about um, make getting something hot to eat, and and somebody had said, speculated, well, Dachshund, that's a dog. Why don't we just call them hot dogs? And that that was that. Yeah. Well, I should, for the interest of, of disclosure here, Sean Groban has just spoke as one of my good friends. Too, so I'm not trying to pack the audience, but <laughs> I, I have that book right over here. It's just to me completely fabricated, but it's well written. It's Paul Gallico, so. Is it Paul Gallico's story? I, or whoever you mentioned, would you mention Paul Gallico or? Yeah, he's, he writes some things in there. And then also, I mean, there's also uh, the story, you know, the one of the four horsemen, there's uh, um, um, and Paul, Carl Rowan's story about Jackie Robinson and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Harry, for being a, just a vendor, he's got a huge amount of uh, myth surrounding him. And there are still things we don't know. We don't know how he went from a Columbus summer game to selling at the world series in three months we just have no idea we obviously have no certainty about where some of these concessions not just hot dogs but mm. things like that we really don't know where it came from it probably is a case that hot dogs came into the ballparks for via new york and the midwest we just don't know so anything that any of you come across uh please feel free to send me this is an ongoing project Thank you. I Thank did you. see the line, one of the things you posted about uh, when they had the bar at the, I guess it was at the Polo Grounds and people started complaining that people, that uh, patrons were paying more attention to the drinking. Yeah, than exactly, food. exactly. So I just like to know how that's different from a lot of ballparks right now. It's not, it's not, it's not. <laughs> if you go to National Sean, Park. Sean, 
Yeah, Sean, the balance between the entertainment experience that you and I always talk about and yeah. the game has always been shifting. And Von Der Aha really owned the Browns to sell beer, whereas the Giants had that Harry Stevens angle really subordinate to the team, which is why they didn't want him to sell alcohol at the beginning and why they got rid of Dasher Troy because he was inebriating too many patrons. But I'm not sure every team would, would do that. I just want to say one more thing. And that is, I also love how the Giants have maintained their history and gone back to New York with the World Series trophy. And um, as a Washington fan, I was actually hoping that they could take, you know, recognize Montreal in some way, because I think there is something to be said for the continuity and it is the same franchise. Although it, it sort of angers people now to, um, you know, because they'll say things like, oh, this was Washington, not Montreal. And um, it's unfortunate because, you know, the Giants have done a great job of that. Um, others, have, you know, the Dodgers kind of left Brooklyn behind. Um, but And Baltimore, for instance, never says anything about St. Louis. But, um, but I really appreciate what the Giants have done to... Um, to maintain their history. Thank you, Sean. Norm, you're up. Well, first, I just want to thank you for the presentation. Almost everything that you said was new to me. And so I very much appreciate it. Oh, well, thanks, Norm. Um, it was a really great presentation. I worked for Harry M. Stevens as a vendor in the stands and then as in the hat check, coat check room at the Stadium Club restaurant. I was given the option one day to cut my hair if I wanted to work. And since <laughs> no, one checked their, no one checked their coats or hats anymore. I mean, like about 25 cents a night, I chose to keep my hair. Um, I just want to share, um, yesterday I was with my friend Rick Swig, and he showed me two artifacts from his collection that I think are relevant to your presentation today. One was a promissory note. It was handwritten by Charles Stoneham for $125,000 to be paid to Harry Stevens at the end of the season. Um, and then signed by Charles Stone. It was a really cool artifact. And the other one was a letter from John Brush to Harry Stevens. And in the letter, he was thanking him for liquor that Harry had sent to him. And then he <laughs> said, I don't want to hurt your feelings or offend you, but I have some advice for you that might help you make more money. And his, his advice was put less liquor in your drinks. <laughs> <laughs> and so i just wanted to share that with you and once again thank you for the presentation i've got to go in a second to dinner but please i want to make sure i get all the questions okay yeah. uh let's go to barry margulies yeah hi i was a great presentation uh, don uh were you able to reach out to john morley or nick parsons not yet i've been you know my day job is work as a diplomat and working on the the war in ukraine so i don't have a lot of free okay. time but Barry, uh, thank you for, Barry gave me a whole pile of stuff, which is right here a few weeks ago. It's invaluable, uh, Barry. And I'll tell you now, I, I want to copy it and send the originals back to you, if that's okay. Right. Okay, thank you. I want so, to you have, uh, Barry, you have, you have probably the best hist archival history there of the company from after Harry's death to the end. That, that's, I've seen that stuff really no place else. And I want to thank you again. Okay, I just want to tell you a little about myself. I started working for Harry M. Stevens in 1961. If you could see this, this is a picture of me selling beer in May of 1961 at Yankee Stadium. Beer was 35 cents a can. Now it's probably around $15, $16. Also, these are the tools as a vendor, a beer vendor, which we used. This is a can opener. <laughs> Search key. And here's another one, Edlin. We use these. Valentine beer. If it got dull, we just take a stone on the sidewalk and just sharpen it, and we got a thing. This is like a weapon today. You can't carry this around, obviously. <laughs> Valentine beer. Well, we had Knickerbocker, Valentine, Paps. Schaefer. Schaefer. Uh, yeah, Schaefer. Nick Schaefer well, Valentine was the Yankees beer. Yeah, Don, Nick, Knickerbocker was the Giants, and what Schaefer was the Dodgers. Right. Yeah. Right. Rindle. Don, we've right got time for two more questions, Don. Two more real quick, yeah. All right, okay. Ed and then Paul. Yeah. Ed, fire sure. away. Yeah, yeah Ken, I'll so be quick. Another, well, thank you. another faded glory, Ken, or Don, I mean, you might want to look at was uh, uh, McAuliffe 
uh, Boston uniforms. My dad was very close. I think his name was Tim, but they made all the uniforms and the caps. And when did when that go? When did that go to the other manufacturers? I don't know. I don't I know. I want to look into that. Uh, and also, you're a diplomat for for who? I'm a director of Russia at the U.S. Institute for Peace in downtown Washington, which okay. is that nice big building you see near the mall. Oh, okay, uh, just a, a personal note. I'm uh, on the board of uh, the Scottsdale chapter of the Association of Former Intelligence Officers. Okay. And we're closely monitoring the whole thing and, and Ukraine as well. Thanks, Thank you. Ed. Ed Freer and then Paul Ellis. All right. I'll, be, I'll be quick. Thank you. My first game was 1954, also with the Polo Grounds, but very memorable is the scorecard where I, I could, you know, had to keep score of the game. That's what really gave me love for the game. But one of the things they shouted with the scoreboard, the scorecard was, you can't tell the players without a scorecard. Yeah. We said. yeah. So that brings me to my question on the vendors shouting, get them water high, get them water high. Was that for the peanuts or the hot dog? The hot I think dog. it's for the hot dog. By the way, I think both phrases were Harry's invention. Yeah. And, and my third question is, Stanford White and the murder, was that the Gibson girl? Yeah. If you, it's a fascinating story. And st after a century, people still write books about it. It's uh, There's several. Uh, uh, Evelyn Nesbitt is the the uh, woman who was the love interest of both Stanford White and the husband. But Harry, again, Harry, I, I'm the one who found out that Harry was the last person Stanford White talked to before he got his hat blown off. But mm. thank you. Thanks, thank you. Paul, why don't you wrap it up? OK, so, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Don. I, you've certainly given us a lot of food for thought tonight. So uh, something to think about. <laughs> Um, listen, I also have the possible connection with a producer um, who did some work for H HBO on sports shows. So if you can get your email to Gary, I'll be glad to make a, a referral and see if I can talk it up. I appreciate for I'm looking for in particular documentarians like Ken Burns. Right. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the kind of person that I'm taught. The, the person I'm thinking of um, actually produced the miniseries on Lincoln for CNN. Um, right. Uh, Gary, Gary, feel free to give him my uh, email. Don, we also are in contact with the uh, HBO who's doing the documentary on Willie Mays. I could send you this guy's email as well. That would be great. That would be great. Listen, uh, Don. The, by the way, we, I want uh, to make a plug for Bill Lamb, who's sitting right there watching, <laughs> who, who is, we're going to see each other in Cooperstown next month, but Bill, and uh, later this month now, but Bill is the expert on Giants ownership going back to the beginning. So whatever you do, sign up or come to his presentation. Perfect. Guys, why don't we give it up for uh, Don? Great performance. Great presentation. Thank you.